Hello, and welcome to the instructional video for Lab 3, where we're going to explore the topic of projectile motion th through a at-home experiment. We're also going to touch on the idea of conservation of energy, um, but um, indirectly through models rather than through a known formula. Okay, so how are we going to do this lab? Well, you're going to build a ramp in order to launch a ball off the edge of the table. You can see here that I built my ramp out of tin foil that's folded over on itself, made into a long strip, and that tin foil then is supported on books and ramps so it doesn't um, get deformed in the process of um, doing the experiment, okay? The ball that I've chosen to use is this one here. It is just a child's bouncy ball, as we can see, okay? All right, and some other pieces of equipment are tape that you're gonna use to tape the paper where you're gonna make measurements onto the ground, okay? And I'll talk about that paper in just a minute. That's just gonna be the impact locations. Um, even if you're um, recording it, the nice white background is um, good for recording um, purposes, okay? I have a pen if I wanna mark any of the impact locations, and of course you need some sort of measuring tape or ruler, all right? Now, I've already measured heights above the table, table that corresponds to points on the ramp. So these three marks on the ramp, marked with pen, represent eight centimeters above the surface of the table, okay? seven and six. So the idea is that I already pre-measured heights above the table, and then I've marked those heights on um, the ramp itself. You wanna do that so you can reliably release the ball from the same location, and you don't care about the length of the ramp, you only care about a height above the table. And you're gonna have five unique heights, and you're gonna do 17 releases from each height. Okay, so let's go ahead and do a single release, but I want to um, lay down my measuring tape to show the way that I'm going to make the measurement. Okay, so I'm gonna lay my measuring tape down here. This is gonna give me a position relative to the edge of the paper. Okay, so let's make this nice and measured like so. Okay, here I want this to be nice and flat. Okay, so I'm gonna have mine I'll make mine relative to a particular point, right? I can always measure, measure that after the fact, but I just wanna have good, good usable data, okay? And I know that's gonna kind of line up with here. So at, uh, before I made the release, I um, noticed where it's hitting the paper. You can see that mark there. And I did this by wetting the ball. I'm not actually gonna collect the data with the wet ball. Um, it's, it's tricky because you kind of have to maybe replace the paper because overall the wet spots um, are large enough that the ball tends to fall um, near that same large spreading wet spot. Um, the, thing, the thing is that there are methods that can work fine where you don't have to record the ball hitting the ground. Um, if you have something like carbon paper or ink, some way to actually get a nice clean mark onto the paper. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a way that works even if you don't have access to carbon paper or ink or some way to get a clean mark onto the paper, okay? All right, so what, how am I gonna do that? Well, I'm just gonna release the ball. Okay, so release it from this height here. Okay, and so I'm gonna move pan away from the release, but that's gonna happen off frame. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna film down here. I'm gonna film it hitting the ground. Okay, so let's get this lined up like so. Okay, so we wanna make sure we have those numbers in focus. Okay, and there we go. Okay, so what I'm gonna do then is I'm going to take that video and I'm just going to look for that single frame where it hit the ground. Um, and you can do that on your phone very easily. And then you can find that single frame where the ball hits the ground, look at the measurement. You don't care about the time here. Just look at the actual physical measurement on the measuring tape that corresponds to that impact location and then record that impact location and then repeat that process. All right, so I'll go, I'll, I'll go ahead and show the idea of finding the frame um, in, a, um, in the next part of this video. So stay tuned. So continuing with these lab directions, I want to further explain the idea of how you would collect a projectile range along the floor for one particular trial um, released at one particular height. So if you recall, I released the ball at a height that I had marked on the ramp that corresponded to eight centimeters above the height of the table, and then I filmed the ball as it fell and hit the ground, and I made sure to have a measuring tape in the frame. In my case, you can kind of see in this this uh, image that I'm about to, uh, the video I'm about to play, you know, I wasn't that careful about measuring um, exactly where the measuring um, or locating the end of the measuring tape. You're gonna wanna make sure that your measuring tape ends 
and for convenience, right at the very edge of the, um, the, basically directly beneath the edge of the table where your ball becomes airborne. That way you will have the full projectile range, in other words, the full distance that the ball is in the air before it hits the ground, okay? The horizontal distance. So I mentioned that it's very easy to collect these, the values of the range from these videos. And again, I totally support other methods um, such as carbon paper or ink. Um, and water will work, but you have to be kind of patient and maybe do it over um, multiple, um, you know, kind of set it up a couple of times or come back to it. Okay, so, um, but let's take a look at the video. Now, I obviously have the video here in my computer, and I'm going to play it in order to get the location um, where the ball hits. But I will stress this again, playing in your phone works so well. You can actually zoom in on the video on most phones and really, really clearly see what, where exactly the ball is hitting the ground. Okay. So you can see there was, there was the impact. I'm going to rewind a little bit. I don't need any fancy software here. Any, any video frame, any you know, ability to play the video is fine. No need to export. I just did so I can make this video. So let's find where the ball hits. Okay, so where does it impact? So in my case, it's hitting right on the tape, which you might think is good, but the problem is it kind of obscures the location. It'd almost be better if it was hitting, say, you know, below so we could kind of draw a line from the the, um, the midpoint of the ball up to um, the ruler and the ruler of course should be perpendicular to the table edge and parallel to the projectile direction ideally but obviously you know there's those are all sources of error and that's fine so i'm going to say that it's well you probably agree it's 8.5 right it's coming right down between the eight and the nine all right so we'll say that that particular trial was um, 8.5 or specifically 18.5 measured from that point and then I would need to know the initial distance um, you know the additional distance all the way to the edge of the table all right so again you're just going to do that just quickly collect the data for each trial now you can go ahead and actually mark them on the paper if you want to then um, measure the physical spread because I asked you to measure the physical distance of the spread of the um, the dots or um, impact locations, but you, you don't need that because you can just also just find the numerical spread of the values and do max minus min and divide by three. The step I'm referring to, by the way, the one that kind of assumes that you are collecting dots on a piece of paper that's taped to the floor is this one in the analysis. If we look, um, so So how close was your visual estimate of standard deviation to the actual calculated, this is number seven, actual calculated standard deviation is done by Excel. Give this as a percent error. So what is the visual estimation of standard deviation? Well, if we go up here, we'll see this in the procedure. Okay. So measure the spread of these locations in the direction of the ball's path. One third of the spread is the approximation of standard deviation. So essentially it's just max minus min divided by three. But again, we could do that without physically measuring the spread. Okay. So now let's look at some mock data, because the idea is that you would just have, you'll do this 17 times for a particular height above the table. Um, you'll, you obviously need to know the table height itself. So you have launch height relative to the tabletop, tabletop height relative to the ground where the paper's taped. Those are your two vertical distances. And then obviously you measure lots of horizontal distances. Okay, so what does that data end up looking like, right? Because you need to kind of see an example. And so let's move over to Excel. All right, so here I've made up some mock data, all right? As you can see, it's mock data. I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in on this. Okay, so <clears throat> these are trials. This would be for one particular height. This is meant to represent a ramp height of eight centimeters. Again, that's the height above the tabletop. I've left all of my distances in centimeters. Um, and so this is the 17 trials, imaginary trials, and this is the projectile range, and that would be the distance from the edge of the table. Okay. Well, so we see, you know, I made, just made up some numbers, and what were we going to want to do with that data? Well, one thing that we want to do with that data is find an average. I'm, assume, I'm assuming that we've, I've already done this for a ramp height of 4, 6, 10, and 12, but I want to show what it would look like for the one I've left blank for 8. So you'd use Excel, you'd use an equal sign to do a calculation with Excel, and then start, start typing the word average. It's gonna come up as a common function, in my case, most recently used, but it's a common function. And then you're just gonna select the cells that you wanna average. So in this case, it would be F3 through F19, okay? And you can type them in, but it's easier to drag and select. All right, so there is your average from those 17 trials. Okay, then we want the visual estimate of the standard deviation. Okay, now again, you might actually be doing that, but if you're just um, going to be doing it with data you've collected from videos that you just 
you know, looked at it, your phone and, and collect the numbers. You, can, you, know, you basically can just fill in the spreadsheet as you go. And so then you're going to have, since we don't need to commit our um, computer to be acting like a giant stopwatch, right? So I'm going to do it like this. I'm going to do max of the data. All right. So there we go. Max. I had to open this set of parentheses. Max of that data minus min of this same set of data. And then divide all of that by three. Okay, so that's my visual estimate of standard deviation. Then I'm going to do the formal standard deviation, which in Excel is STDEV. Then I'll select the data. Okay, and this is all fake data, so we'll see, you know. But we can see that the, the visual estimate, the rough estimate of standard deviation, is a slightly less than the more complicated, statistically accurate version of standard deviation. Okay? So that, that's, that's some um, values that you would need. Okay, because you're going to ask um, to report a comparison between the two. I'm, however, I'm going to go ahead and move on and take my average value. So I'm going to copy my average over here with Control C. When I paste a value in here, since I don't want to paste it normally, because otherwise it's going to look for cells to do the same calculation, because in this highlighted cell is a calculation, and that calculation is always cell, um, it's cell location dependent. Instead, I'm going to do Control Command C, um, or excuse me, Control Command V, which is paste special. And then I can just paste the values, OK? See, in that way, it's just a number, all right? Obviously, my other made-up numbers have um, much, many fewer significant um, figures. Don't worry about any of that. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and graph it, OK? So what, um, the big thing I ask you to do is compare between models. So in this case, you've collected all your data, taken all your averages, and now you want to actually make your graph, OK? Um, I'd say, well, there's two big things. There's comparing between the models and adding error bars. So I'm going to show you both those steps. I'll just move right through them. All right, so I'm going to insert a figure. All right, so go right over here. I'm going to use a scatter plot. All right, so then it automatically is then um, graphing the projectile height as a function of ramp height, and or excuse me, the projectile range as a function of ramp height, which is what we expect. Here's our data. All right, it looks kind of linear. But the other competing model is a square root model. Square root models for small ranges of values don't look that different from linear, which is kind of um, an inherent trouble between comparing between these two models, but it's still fun to try. So what do we want to do? All right, so first, let's do the trend line comparison. All right now, obviously, you don't want to um, add axis titles and get rid of your table um, title. OK, all right. And you definitely want axis titles. I won't bother to add them, but you can think about how you do that after the fact when you actually present this and turn it in. OK. So then what you're going to want to do is go ahead and add a trend line. So I'm going to go over here. I'm going to go to, um, to chart elements. There's a number of ways to do it, but here I'm going to add a trend line. I'll just go to more trend line options. So the first, we'll start with a linear trend line. Okay. I want to display the equation on the chart, and I want to display the R squared value. Okay. The R squared value tells me the goodness of fit, basically how how linear this data is, or how much of the behavior of the data is explained by a linear model assumption. Okay, so there we go. We see we have an equation of a trend line. You're gonna um, you're gonna want that that equation because it's gonna you're gonna be able to answer a question about where it would intercept um, the vertical axis and whether that makes sense when you're actually turning things in. All right, and so this is one of the graphs. The the only other graph that you want, well, almost. We'll add something to this graph in just a minute. But as a separate graph, you're also gonna want to do a power fit. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So here, you see we've done a power fit. Now there's one kind of issue with this power fit. Is it once I don't I don't care about that leading coefficient, but I specifically want it to be x to the one half power because I want a square root relationship. But here Excel has tried to outsmart me and say, well, maybe it's it's actually closer to 0.818. Well, that's fine, but that's not what I'm trying to compare to. I'm trying to compare linear not to any power fit, but specifically to a power fit of power one half. So hmm, that's not great, right? So if, if Excel happens to give you 0.5 or something close to 0.5, kind of within the range of, say, 0.48 and 0.52, then I'd say that's fine. You're, you're close enough and you can, you can compare the R squared values. In this case, we actually see that this is a better fit because it's 0.98 instead of with linear, it was 0.9951. Oh, no, excuse me, the linear is actually the better one, because anything closer to one is the better fit. So this, this one is basically saying that the behavior of the data is 99.5% um, of that behavior is explained by a linear fit, whereas only 98.8% of the behavior of the data is explained by the power fit. 
But look what we can do to, to force Excel to do a power fit with the particular exponent we want. So what I would do is I would instead take my projectile range, I'm now creating a new column, I'm going to take it, and I'm going to ra raise it to the one half power, like so, basically taking the square root of it. And you can also do this, if you do SQRT, that's also a square root function built in Excel. But raising something to a one half power is the same as a square root. Okay. And so then I'm just going to take those values. Since I'm dragging down that calculation, now it's doing it to each cell to the, immediately to the left. So I've just taken the square root of all the made up projectile range values. I'm going to go ahead and label this column as range squared. It's always good to label your columns. It helps you understand what's going on and you don't get lost. Okay, so that's range squared like that. All right, so now I want to graph ramp height versus range squared. So I'm going to go ahead and select this column. I'm going to do, hold down the command key and select this other column. And I'm going to make a new graph, which of course will also be a scatter plot. OK, so now we're graphing the um, projectile range um, to the 1 half power. Um, oh, and it's actually not squared. My title is misleading. It's range to the 1 half, just to be particular there, right? So anyway, so now, we're, now we have a graph of the square root of projectile range is a function of ramp height above the table. Well, if we want to see how this data compares to our linear assumption on the previous data, we actually do a linear fit on this square root data. Because if we do a linear fit on this data and our R squared value is better than the linear fit we had on the data that we didn't manipulate, then that actually tells us that the square root model is better. Okay. So actually, and let's go back to um, the, current, the fit we had before. So there's a trend line. I want to go back to linear so we can actually see the number. Okay, so I'm going to go back to this, this chart here. Okay, and you'd want, you'd want, if you did include this one with the, um, the, square, the um, square root of the ranges, you'd want it very clearly label on the axis that is the square root of, of, of the ranges, and then the units would be the square root of centimeters. So I'm going to go ahead and add a trend line. Okay, so I'll go over chart design chart element, trend line, and a different version of Excel, it's in different places, but you can always do a quick Google search to find out where um, these options are in your particular version of Excel. More trend line options, and then linear, okay? Now I want to display the equation and display R squared. All right, there we have it, okay. So, now we compare. Which one's better? Which of the two fits is better? The straight up linear model, or the one that looks like a linear model, but actually is a square root model? All right, well, you see it. The original linear model is better. 9951 is closer to 1 than 9938. Okay, so the actual, so this pretend data supports the linear model. Your, yours might too. The theory tells us the square root model should be the right one. That's kind of a, a given away the, um, you know, the, the secret here. But that's fine. The real data doesn't have to perfectly match models. All right, because there's other things going on, and you can discuss that. Okay, so the last thing I want to show, the big, big important step, is adding trend lines. So we'll get rid of the square root one completely. We won't need it. Um, excuse me, adding error bars. All right. So to add error bars, I would want to create another column, and I would label this column st um, standard deviation. We'll call it standard dev for close, for short, rather. Okay. And I have one sort of real standard deviation, the one I calculated from fake data. So I'll do control C. And that corresponds to a ramp height of 8. Um, control Command V to just get the value for it. There we go. And then we'll make up some other standard deviations for the other ones. All right, so I have 0 0.55, um, 1, we'll say that 1.0, big standard deviation on that one. All right, and then how about 0 0.8? I'll make this one even bigger, 1.33. Okay, so these are the standard deviations. These would, also, these would all be measured in centimeters. The error always has the same units as the original data. Okay, so what would I do with those standard deviations? Well, I would then add them to the graph to represent actual error. And let's make them a little bit bigger so you can really see them. Okay, so I just want to make this one two, make that one three, this one 2.7. So now I know you, I just calculated one that was smaller than that, but I just want them to show up on the graph clearly. And I'll speak to what you would do if they didn't show up. I'll make that 3.33. Okay. Okay. So then you're going to go to your graph. You're going to go back to chart design. You're going to want to add a chart element. In this case, you want to add error bars. Okay. And you want to go more error bar options. 
Okay, so you can see we always need to use the extra options. And you're going to go down to the very bottom and do custom. All right. Now, why is that? Well, because all the built-in ones, fixed value, percentage, standard deviation, they're not real. Because how can it know standard deviation if it's not calling from you know, a body of calculations? So these are actually very, um, very strange. They're not, they don't really do anything within Excel. But we can, we can do them ourselves. So we're going to do specify value. And then we're just going to select those cells that had the standard deviation. But I need to move the graph out of the way so I can actually select them. There we go. So let's go back to our error bar. So one thing you want to do is Excel will automatically, we'll get back to this custom select, but let me just mention something else first. Excel will automatically add these horizontal error bars. They don't, they have no meaning. We only, we only want error in the vertical direction. We only, we only, we only want error in the dependent variable. The projectile range is a function of ramp height, right? Because the vertical axis is projectile range. The ramp height above the table is the horizontal, all right? So there's no error in the dependent variable or the independent variable. So let's get rid of that. So all I've done is just click on any one of the horizontal error bars, thus selecting all of them, and I just hit delete or backspace, and they're all gone, okay? So now let's go back to the vertical one and then go to custom. So it wants me to specify the positive and the negative values of my custom error bars. For each of those, I'm gonna select the same cells, the five cells that correspond to my five standard deviations that I made up, but you will have calculated. Okay, so I just grab those, select them, and then re-expand my menu, and then do the exact same thing for negative, because I want the error bars to be symmetric. It allows them to be non-symmetric, but we want ours to be symmetric. There we go. So check it out, I've added error bars, and you can see they're not all the same size. Like for example, on the ramp height of 10, that, that's the one where I arbitrarily chose the standard deviation to be smaller than the rest, and we can sure see that the error bar is smaller. Okay? These error bars are nice and big, they're very visible, but what can happen sometimes is your data might be so reliable, your ramp and your ball might be behaving so nicely that your error is actually quite small. In that case, just multiply your error by 10 or, or whatever value it takes to make it visible on the graph and make note of that in your graph. Just add a caption below being, saying that error bars are magnified by 10 in order to be visible. Okay? So I expect you to do that if the error bars are invisible. Don't just say, oh, you can't see the error bars are too small. Because they might be so small that they're actually hidden behind the graphic that represents the data point. And just quick note, each of these blue dots is an average. That's why it makes sense to add an error bar to an average, because that's the spread of the data around the average. Okay, so that's it for the actual um, process that you're gonna do with, it, with Excel. Um, so it's kind of some neat opportunity to do some new stuff with Excel um, for this class. Um, and, and then um, just uh, at the very beginning, um, how to actually set up the lab. I think the data collection on this one is easier than most. So um, I hope it goes well. And of course, contact me if you have any questions, concerns, or something doesn't go well. All right, thank you so much for watching.